now uh, we will have a look at uh, how a typical uh, you know cash flow st uh, statement looks like okay uh well uh, we'll just uh, go back to the you know here we are here so uh, this is a typical cash flow statement okay first is uh, the alpha okay what are the cash flow from operating activities uh, we will see that in detail now first we will have something called as profit before tax see profit before tax is calculated from the uh, cash flow from the operation operating activities so in order to get cash flow from operating activities uh, from the profit before tax we have to make some adjustments what are those adjustments any depreciation and amortization should be added back that is the first secondly any finance cost incurred should be added back what is finance cost means any finance raised either through equity or to debt any cost of equity is dividend paid any cost of debt debt is the coupon rate or the interest which you pay to the lenders so that will be added back because that does not form part of the uh, operating activities so we will add those amounts back to pbt that is profit before tax any interest income received because of the investment which is basically an investing activity will be reduced from the profit before tax okay because in interest income is not the income from the operating activity that is the reason why we have to reduce interest income from the profit before tax now coming to operating profit before working capital changes so let us see how things uh, we have to make uh, adjustments for this see first of all we consider trade receivable and short term loans and advances see any increase in trade receivables or any increase in sundry debtors both are same if it increases you subtract from the working capital if there is any decrease in sundry debtor then we add that amount back to the working capital chain short term loans and advances given okay any short term loans and advances given will be a plus we, uh, and any short term loans and advances received will be a minus similarly inventories see if there is any increase in inventory you have to reduce from the working capital changes any decrease in the inventory we have to add add it back to the work, work you know uh, operating profit before working capital changes any trade payable is sundry uh, creditor right see whenever sundry creditor increase it is just the opposite of what we do here okay whatever i explained here that is trade receivable if sundry uh, trade receivable is sundry debtor if increase in sundry debtor what we do we reduce from the working capital any increase in trade payable okay we add it back similarly any short term loans and advances what we do we reduce similarly so whatever activities which we do here the opposite activities is done for trade payable short term provisions and other current liabilities which we have to do the adjustment in the working capital changes so sundry creditors is we have to make the payment so any increase in sundry creditor we have to add it to the working capital any decrease in sundry creditor we have to subtract from the working capital okay understood now this will give you cash generated from the operations once it is done you have to subtract the taxes paid and this is going to be the net cash from the operating activities now coming to cash flow from investing activities it is very simple any purchase or sale of fixed asset what do you do if you purchase a fixed asset an investment is done so if an investment is done the uh, you know uh, that will get reduced okay from the investing activity any sale of 
uh, asset the money will come back so that will be added back to the investing activity similarly increase oblique decrease in non current investment any increase in non current investment is an investing activity that means you have made the investment so you have to reduce it from the because the money has gone so investment has been done any decrease in non current investment you have to add it back because the money has been received similarly reduction oblique increasing long term loans and advances if there is a reduction in long term loans and advances what has uh, uh, happened the money has come back to you so the cash flow is positive the money is come back if there is increase in long term loans and advances it it will get reduced from the investing activity because the money has cash has gone out any interest income is a receipt so you add it back so this will become net cash used in the investing activity now coming to cash flow in financing any increase in long term borrowings is a receipt so you add so any decrease in long term borrowing is a expenditure so that will subtract similarly increase oblique decrease in short term borrowing same for long term the same uh, you know analogy is used for long term increase of de decrease in long term provisions so if you increase the you know uh, long term provisions uh, then it means money is retained with you so you add any decrease in long term provision you have liquidated the money because provisions what whatever provisions have they has been given out so that will be a reduction from the uh, you know cash flow increase oblique decrease in deferred tax liabilities so if the tax deferred tax liability increase the cash is retained hence the cash inflow is there so that's why you add any decrease in tax deferred tax liabilities you have paid the tax hence the you know uh, amount will get deducted because the cash has gone out increase oblique decreasing long term provisions increasing long term provisions you add because cash inflow is there any decrease in long term provisions you deduct because the cash outflow is there finally dividend paid is cash outflow so you take it out from the financing activities similarly finance cost like interest and other things you have to reduce because it is a cash outflow so this will be the net cash from the financing activities this is going to be the net net cash generated which is a plus b plus c cash and cash equivalents at the beginning period and cash and cash equivalent at the end period should be equal to the net cash generated now coming to the second part that is b bravo cash flow from investing activities so any purchase oblique sale of fixed asset see if you purchase any uh, uh, any asset what happens as we have discussed from the cash will reduce okay if you sell any a uh, fixed asset the cash will increase okay see if you purchase say a fixed asset money gets reduced okay if you sell a fixed asset the money increases so cash flow from investing activities you have to see whether the money has been invested or the money has been received increase oblique decrease in non current investments see if there is an increase in non current investment it is a financing act financial activity and you add it back if there is any decrease in non current investments that means the money has been plowed back you have received it reduction oblique increasing long term loans and advances if there in any reduction in long term loans and advances you add it back because that is the money which you have received if there is any increase in long term loans and advances you reduce that much amount because that is the activity which has happened in the investing arena now interest income received you add it back because that is the amount you have received from the investment you have made see net cash used in the investing activities will be you know reduct you know uh, uh, subtraction or addition okay so cash flow from investing activities will be if you purchase any fixed asset you reduce it reduce the amount from the investing activity amount if you sell you add 
if the non current investment increase it means you have used the cash so it will be a, a investing activity so money has reduced however if you uh, if the current non current investment uh, you know decrease you add it back because that is the money which has been received back similarly if the long term loans and advance reduce means the money has been received back and if the long term loans increase it means the money has been utilized and that you will subtract and interest income you have to add because that is the income you are receiving from all the investing activities which you have carried out in the previous year okay so that is the net cash used in investing activities will be here next coming to charlie cash flow from financing activities financing means you know loan taking loan uh, you know redemption and all that any increase in long term borrowings is the money received so you add that any decrease in long term borrowing means you have utilized the money to decrease your liability so you will reduce that any increase oblique decrease in short term borrowings those are the the uh, you know um, analysis will be the same if the short term borrowing increase means money has been received so you add it any decrease in short term borrowing means the money has been given back uh, so the liability will decrease through the financing activity similarly increase oblique decrease in long term provisions any long term provisions made you will be any increase in long term provisions made will be a minus and any decrease in long term provisions will be a plus similarly increase oblique decrease in deferred tax liability so if the deferred tax liability increases it is a plus whereas if the deferred tax liability decreases it you have to subtract from the financing activity similarly you have to uh, do the analysis as per the long term provisions also whatever the dividend paid has to be reduced because it it is a financing activity so whatever the finance cost that is interest paid for bonds interest paid for the uh, loan taken from the bank it will all form part of the financing activity so that amount you have to reduce so this will be the net cash from financial activity whatever the cash received and whatever is the cash uh, uh, paid uh, if when you add and subtract this will be the net cash from financial activities so this is the net cash generated so what will be the net cash generated cash flow from operating activity plus cash flow from investing activity plus cash flow from financing activity will all come together to form the net cash generation so this is a typical cash flow statement analysis now coming to the cash and cash equivalent at the beginning period and cash and cash equivalent at the end period will be the if you subtract both of them you will get the net cash so that should be equal now let us come to financial ratios so now we have analyzed what is a cash flow statement now you have seen what are the components of a balance sheet so we generally know what are the various components and how cash flow statements and the various events which happen in a cash flow analysis will affect and we have analyzed earnings per share diluted earnings per share and all these aspects we have analyzed now based on the uh, general knowledge which we have on a balance sheet a profit and loss statement and a cash flow statement then we will have to analyze the financial ratios if you have to analyze or value a company so that is that's why it is called as equity valuation so in order to understand equity valuation these are the basic things which you should know about a financial uh, a statement analysis that is understanding of the balance sheet understanding of the cash flow statement understanding of the profit and loss account with this a small cursory and a very a basic understanding then we should understand where are what are the various financial ratios and we will discuss each one of them now now a ratio is gen generally gives the power to compare two companies of different sizes see if you want to buy a very big company and a very small company uh, it becomes very difficult because a bigger company will generate uh, you know more revenues than the smaller company but that should not be the case 
you know if a company is uh, generating uh, you know uh, more income from you know uh, reduced resources and a bigger company is reducing smaller income from higher resources uh, then those two are not comparable so how do we make those comparison we make the comparison using something known as financial ratio uh, what are the different types of financial ratio let us understand that see one is the liquidity ratio okay liquidity means how good a company is with its finances cash and other things next is leverage ratio leverage ratio is how good the company is utilizing the uh, resources which it, which it has got in terms of uh, cash and cash equivalents and the loans which has been taken it means leverage ratio generally gives whatever the money has been borrowed and whatever the assets which are there with the company at any point of time will the assets available at any particular point be able to uh, you know liquidate all the liabilities of the company so that will give you the uh, general inputs about the leverage ratio next is turnover ratio is basically related to your operations and profitability ratio basically depends upon the you know productivity of the company company management so and various aspects are uh, uh, required to ca- you know calculate the profit uh, profit see actually these are the factors which affect actually the profitability ratio then there are something known as valuation ratios okay now coming to liquidity ratio in liquidity ratio we have current ratio what is the current ratio current ratio is nothing but current assets divided by current liability so where do you get these two values you tell me so you we get these two value from the balance sheet what are the total current assets and what are the total current liability so if you divide current asset by current liability that becomes the current ratio current ratio determines the ability of the firm to fulfill its obligation for the current operating cycle see for the short term whatever the assets are there will the asset be able to liquidate all the liabilities available so let us say if this current ratio is 1 it means the assets held by the company is good enough to pay off all the debts of the company that is short term debts we are talking that's why it is current okay we as soon as you this name comes current it becomes short term okay now if the value is greater than 1 it means assets are more than the liability so company is quite comfortable with the uh, short term uh, assets which will be able to liquidate the short term liability and still some amount will be left with the company so if the current ratio is greater than 1 the company is quite comfortable so higher the current ratio higher the short term solvency of the com- solvency means the company will not go bankrupt the company will be solvent see keep an eye on higher proportion of current assets in the form of cash and cash equivalent than inventories a very important point see if you are holding more inventories it will give a very bad picture so we have to be very careful while uh, you know seeing current ratio whether cash and cash equivalents are forming a major proportion of this current ratio or the inventories are forming a major proportion if the inventories are making a very major proportion it means there is not enough business the inventory is not being utilized in the short term so that will not give a very good picture about the company's operating performance see asset te- uh, test ratio means immediate cash so it here you will consider only cash and cash equivalents see acid risk test ratio is also called as quick ratio which is nothing but quick assets divided by current liability quick assets are nothing but current assets and you deduct the inventories so whatever the problem you are facing here with current ratio to so acid t- uh, test ratio no that is going to solve that problem here quick assets you are reducing the inventory so whatever the current assets are there only cash cash equivalent and other assets should be equal to able to you know liquidate all your liability now coming to cash ratios cash ratio is nothing but cash and bank balances plus current investments divided by current liability is a straight forward ratio see current investments include short term marketable securities held by the company now 
these are all the various uh, you know liquidity ratios now we will come to the leverage ratios see financial leverage means how much the company has borrowed over and above its repaying capabilities so if the company has borrowed more than its you know total assets then the company is leveraged see usually uh, you know um, uh, manufacturing uh, companies usually will have more leverage uh, okay uh, but uh, leverage should be properly executed and it would should be properly utilized uh, see it helps in assessing the risk arising out of use of debt capital debt means loans taken bonds issued they all form debt capital see there are two types of financial ratios uh, that is uh, leverage ratio one is structural ratio which indicates the proportion of debt and equity and next is the coverage ratio refers to the debt servicing ratio and debt to assets ratio so we will discuss both of them see when when we start discussing you will understand what is a structural ratio and what is a coverage ratio okay uh, see these words look very very uh, you know Uh, high end debt but uh, actually when you understand it it's very simple what are structural ratios simple debt to equity ratio debt to equity ratio is nothing but total liabilities of the company divided by shareholders equity what are the shareholders equity we will see that total liability will be include both current liability and non current liability you have to be very careful with this so debt to equity ratio will have total liabilities divided by shareholders equity so equity is share capital plus reserves and surpluses held as per the balance sheet if the debt to equity ratio is lower then it is better why because if the liabilities are lesser than the shareholders equity then each shareholder has to uh, will be liable to pay less in terms of liabilities so the lower the debt to equity ratio the better it is now coming to debt to asset ratio simple in uh, you know only thing is the denominator will change uh, the numerator will remain the same so it indicates whether the assets held supports the debts of the company simple so debt to asset ratio is nothing but total liabilities divided by total assets so uh, as i said only the denominator has changed the total assets are the you know entire assets held by the company now coming to the coverage ratio this is uh, uh, you know uh, we have to go a little bit uh, detail into this see interest coverage ratio uh, see the company if it has leveraged it has taken lot of loan whatever the profit generated should be able to cover the interest which it has to pay for the loans taken okay now in that case the interest coverage ratio is profit before you know uh, interest and taxes divided by the interest total interest the company has to pay so profit before pvit means profit before interest and taxes divided by the interest the company has to pay higher the interest coverage ratio the better it is okay that means if the uh, pvit is far higher than the interest the company has to pay then the company will be able to service all its uh, debts properly so that is one of the components of the interest coverage ratio see even if the profit before interest oblique taxes is less but if the ratio is high still lenders can consider lending to firm because uh, you know the pbit may be less accordingly proportionately the interest component will also be less hence the uh, ratio is higher so Uh, the lenders will consider uh, lending them because they will be confident that the uh, you know interest at least component uh, the the company has to pay to them will come regularly to them so uh, interest coverage ratio is also a major factor for bond rating because whenever a company raises bond it will say a coupon rate of 5% will be given 6% will be given when they say 5% 6% or 10% because usually corporate bonds give very high interest rates of 9 to 10 10 11 10, some gives even 15% so if they have to generate 15% then the interest coverage ratio should be at least 4 to 5 times the 4 uh, to 5 times that is uh, Uh, f- the interest component uh, the the profit component is five times the interest component 
now coming to fixed charges coverage ratio so there are two components here fixed charges and then coverage ratio see it determines how many times the cash flow before interest and taxes covers all fixed financing charges see what are the fixed financing charges dividends to be paid okay interest to be paid you know bond uh, coupon rates to be paid they all form under financing so fixed car charges coverage ratio is nothing but pbit plus depreciation and amortization which is a non cash expense uh, divided by c what is c we will see c is equal to a plus b what is a a is interest and b is the loan repayment amount divided by 1 minus c this is you know we we are see we could have just taken loan repayment amount but we are dividing it by 1 minus tax rate because the tax you know the interest we pay is not ta tax deductible you know it will you know uh, it is not income tax deductible hence our corporate tax deductible hence we have to add it back that is why we say b is equal to loan repayment amount divided by 1 minus tax rate so uh, when you add these two and you divide the pbit plus depreciation and amortization by this value you will get the fixed charges coverage ratio okay now coming to debt service coverage ratio debt service coverage ratio is nothing but profit after tax plus depreciation generally you add because it is a non cash expenses plus non cash charges whatever you have deducted plus interest paid on term loan plus whatever is the lease rentals you have to pay divided by whatever the interest on term loan lease rental plus repayment of term loan will be your debt service coverage ratio higher the better any value within 1.5 to 2 is considered good for as a debt service coverage ratio now coming to the turnover ratios see turnover ratio is also called as asset management ratio that's why i told you it basically depends upon the management and the uh, productivity this in ratio indicates how effectively and efficiently the assets are managed by the firm inventory turnover ratio means this ratio indicates how efficiently the inventory is moving through the firm whether the firm is inventory heavy or the firm is see if the inventory is heavy means more amount is invested in the inventory if they are not able to rotate the inventory efficiently uh, inventory is actually uh, consume more money because you have to have inventory uh, uh, holding charges will be there uh, so uh, the more inventory you hold you have to uh, spend more on inventory holding charges so how efficiently you keep your inventory so a lean inventory will always give the company some amount of money to be invested back so that they can generate uh, interest so uh, inventory turnover ratio is a very important component so inventory turnover ratio is nothing but revenue from operations divided by the average inventory held what is your average inventory inventory at the start of the year minus inventory at the end of the year it will be your average inventory see actually this ratio is not a good indication of the firm's performance because of low inventory may be the result of lack, lack of production and hence lack of sales uh, or loss of sales also see this is you know uh, that you can always assess from the uh, you know operational performance of a company but generally they say you know lesser the inventory may uh, you can take it as a that the company is not producing enough goods now this is very important debtor turnover ratio see debtor turnover ratio is nothing but revenue from operations or net credit sales whatever the credit sales which has been made divided by average trade receivables we have explained average trade receivable what are the average trade receivable see higher the debtor turnover ratio the better it is now coming to the average collection period see it indicate number of days the credit sales is locked in with the debtors oblique trade receivables so very simple concept average collection period means when you give your manufactured goods to the retailer or uh, authorized dealer when will the authorized dealer pay you back for how many days that you know amount is locked with the debtor or the trade receivable 
that is known as average collection period so your average collection period is average trade receivable divided by average daily credit sales so whatever the daily credit sales you make you would easily uh, be able to assess and average trade receivables um, can be easily assessed see what is the relation between average collection period and debtor turnover which we have just explained see average collection period is 365 divided by debtor turnover okay this is just for your info fixed this will be you know this when you do the mathematics and you know problems are solved uh, then this will be required now coming to fixed asset turnover ratio fixed utter asset turnover ratio is nothing but revenue from operation divided by average net fixed assets held by the company total assets turnover ratio only the denominator changes total revenues divided by average total assets instead of net fixed assets total assets whether it is fixed non fixed everything will be considered see we have to understand that you see asset turnover ratio is affected by the old and depreciated assets hence the denominator will be small due to the depreciation which we had done over a period of time which is deducted from the value of the asset now coming to the profitability ratio see it reflects the final results of the business operation profitability ratio since assets are assessed at historical value and all the numerator as cur at current value see profitability ratio gives an generally gives an upward bias there are two types of profitability ratio profit margin ratio and rate of return ratio let us understand profit margin ratio it determines the relation between profit and sales simple see any profitability ratio sales component will always be there okay so there are various uh, you know profitability ratio margin ebitda margin what is ebitda margin ebitda is nothing but earnings before interest taxes depreciation and amortization okay it is the ratio of ebitda to total sale total revenue total revenue is nothing but your total sales also okay see ebitda margin removes the influence of capital structures from the earnings see what is the influence of capital structure influence of capital structure it only means that the interest you are required to pay okay so earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization so capital structure is not considered here if you reduce the interest which you are paying from ebitda ebitda then it you know will have an effect that we will see afterwards so ebitda margin is nothing but ebitda divided by total revenue or nothing but, you know you can total revenue can also be considered as total sales now coming to operating profit margin see operating profit margin is the ratio of uh, pbit and total revenues and net profit margin is you know profit after tax divided by total revenue see net profit margin determines the earning left to the shareholders as a percentage of the total revenue see this is very important for equity shareholders now coming to rate of return ratios uh, see in rate of return ratios there are lot of uh, you know things we have to understand one is return on asset uh, in rate of return ratio we consider pat that is profit after tax see it is the ratio of pat and average total assets held and earnings power what is earnings power it is the ratio of profit before interest tax and average total assets okay see it is again a measure of business performance and not affected by the capital structure i have uh, i have already explained what is capital structure uh, earnings power is basically suited for inter firm comparison this is a very very important ratio profitability ratio that is return on capital employed it is the post tax version of earning powers it is cons it considers the effect of taxation but still it ignores the capital structure it is the ratio of net operating profit after tax divided by average total assets okay 
net operating profit after tax is nothing but PBIT into 1 minus tax rate. Because you have to reduce the tax component. So return on capital employed is no PAT divided by average total assets. Another very, very important concept that is return on equity. And it is very important for equity shareholders. Return on equity is nothing but equity earnings divided by average equity. See, there are two components here, equity earnings and average equity. Equity includes paid up capital plus reserves and surpluses. In, as we can see in the uh, balance sheet, paid up capital plus whatever the reserves and surpluses which has held. So that forms the equity part. The numerator is that is equity earnings is profit after tax less preference dividends. So you have to reduce the preference dividends from the profit after tax. Then only see because uh, preference shares uh, will get precedence. Hence, whatever dividends which has to be paid to them has to be paid and that will get reduced from the profit after tax. So that is the only amount which will be left for the equity shareholders. That is common equity shareholders. So the numerator is patless preference dividends divided by the average equity. See, uh, profit after tax less preference dividend is also called as return on, that is return on equity. This component is also called as return on net worth and return on shareholders funds. It measures the profitability of the equity funds invested in the firm. Whatever the equity funds invested, how much they are going to get. Uh, at the end of you know after all the liabilities are cleared PAT is the uh, one pre pat, pat less uh, preference dividend is the money left for the common equity shareholders it also reflects the productivity of the ownership invested in the firm now the last one is the valuation ratio see valuation ratio reflects the combined influence of risk and return so let us understand it reflects the influence of the risk also and return also. It is the most comprehensive measure of a firm's performance. Now coming, see we will uh, uh, explain all this once again uh, in the next uh, chapter. Uh, but uh, for the time being, since we have uh, to uh, see what our valuation ratio, I am going to explain. But how price to earning ratios are uh, generated and what are the various components, we'll explain in detail. See, price to earning ratio reflects the growth prospects, risk characteristics, shareholder orientation, corporate image and degree of liquidity. Price to earnings reflects all these things. Because earnings are involved, when earnings are involved, then there will be growth prospects involved. When the earning is involved, then there will be risk characteristics involved. And whenever the price comes into picture, whether the price you are paying is high or low, then the risk component will come into say. Then shareholder orientation will come into picture because if the price to earning ratio is higher, the shareholder is ready to pay more for a rupee invested in that company. Okay. Corporate image will also come into picture because if the price to earning ratio is high, it means the company is doing well because the uh, shareholder is ready to pay more price for one rupee invested in the company. And the degree of liquidity also. Better the company, better the risk characteristics, better the shareholder orientation. Normally, that company will be highly liquid. So what is P by E ratio? It is market price per share divided by earnings per share, that is EPS. Now coming to enterprise value to EBITDA ratio. See enterprise value means market value of equity. Okay, what is the market value of equity? The price plus market value of the debt. So enterprise value considers both the equity value also market value of the equity also and the market value of all the debt what is market value of equity it is the number of outstanding shares into the market price very simple and what is the market value of debt usually 
uh, a rupee of debt at any particular point of time is considered equivalent to a rupee of market value so ebitda is nothing we have already explained and ebitda ev to ebitda ratio reflects the profitability growth liquidity and corporate image also because while we are considering enterprise value you are con considering the market value of the equity also and the market value of the debt also now coming to another important component see how these uh, price to earnings are derived how market value to book value is derived i will explain later uh, uh, see market value to book value reflects the contribution of the firm to the wealth of the society how if the market value is higher than the book value it means the company is doing well if this ratio is greater than 1 then the firm has continued to wealth creation now how to effectively utilize financial statements uh, there are various types of analysis the first one is the cross section analysis here what we do the industry average in all these ratios are already set so this can be used as a benchmark to analyze a firm and secondly through time series analysis here the ratios of the firms will be compared over time like past 5 years or past 10 years so that is time series analysis common size statement is a little bit complex what we do here is here we compare companies using percentages rather than numbers see numbers you know it may deceive you but percentages will always uh, give correct uh, uh, comparison between companies here what they do profit and loss is expressed as a percentage of sales very important because sale is the main component so in every profit and loss is ex every component of the profit and loss is expressed as a percentage of sales and balance sheet as a percentage of total assets held by the company one more uh, method is common base year financial statement what they do is here they will identify a base year 5 years before 10 years before here what they do if you want to analyze a company for its intrinsic value then we can select a base year okay 10 year before 5 year before and all subsequent financial statements are calculated as a percentage of that base year it is very simple whatever you do here in profit and loss as a percentage of sales here we do you take a you know base year and every profit and loss and uh, you know balance sheet is divided by the base year uh, values the same values okay then you get a percentage this is known as common base year financial statements so how do you estimate the intrinsic value of a company let us see there are three uh, you know methods of equity valuation one is balance sheet technique uh, it has got book value liquidation value and replacement cost and discounted cash flow model dividend discount model free cash flow model and uh, relative valuation techniques that's what i told you in relative valuation techniques we have price to earning ratio price to book ratio and price to sales ratio so in my next lecture uh, we will do this valuation game that is how to estimate the uh, do the equity valuation using these balance sheet techniques discounted cash flow model and relative valuation techniques thank you very much